We're very pleased to have Ron Esplin as our first speaker today. Ron was born in Cedar City, Utah, raised in the Salt Lake Valley, and graduated with a degree in history from the University of Utah. He has graduate degrees in history from the University of Virginia and Brigham Young University. For eight years in the 1970s, Ron worked in the LDS Historical Department under Leonard Arrington, and for 25 years was a professor of church history and a senior research historian at the Joseph Fielding Smith Institute for Latter-day Saint History at Brigham Young University. For 16 of those years, he served as director of the institute. Today, he serves as managing editor of the Joseph Smith Papers Project in the Family and Church History Department in Salt Lake City, and with Richard Bushman and Dean C. Jesse as one of the general editors of the Joseph Smith Papers publication. His publications deal mainly with Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and the periods of our history. With that, we'd like to welcome Ron Esplin as our first speaker. Thanks, Scott. I'm pleased to be here. This is a good season for the Joseph Smith Papers because we are finally counting down to publication and will be more than a virtual project. Uh, Max Evans, who headed the NHPRC, the National Historical Records and Com uh, Publications Commission, which is a commission of the National Archives, is now on our board of directors, the uh, editorial board of the Joseph Smith Papers longtime friend, many of you may, may know him from his work in history in Utah earlier. Max said to us once when he looked at our ambitious publication schedule, Ron, you have to remember nobody, in other words, these kinds of projects, nobody ever gets anything done the first five years. It takes that long to get your arms around the project. And in fact, there's been a recent study of documentary editing projects which suggest that the average time is seven years. Uh, we have then become uh, more or less average. We haven't beat the average, but we're not looking embarrassing in the company we travel in. But finally, we're moving to publication beginning this fall with our first volume, um, late fall, and another volume first quarter of next year, and marching forward with two, sometimes three volumes a year from that point. I want to say one word about the orientation of the project that will provide some context and background that would be useful as I provide an overview with the aid of this PowerPoint. I notice the first word on your program is defending. And the last word on our vita for, or our description of the Joseph Smith papers would be defending. And that's important for you to know. There'll be plenty of materials in our corpus once they're done for defending and for those who are so minded, they'll find some things for attacking. But our job is to present the material in a scholarly fashion that folks from many persuasions and certainly non-member scholars can access, have confidence in, and use to write better history about Joseph Smith and early Mormon beginnings. The brethren who have control of our materials, without whom we could not publish, because the church owns 90% of the Joseph Smith papers, have clarified over the years that it's essential that we meet the scholarly audience first, that everything about our work, our eventual uh, website, our publications must be geared to the scholarly audience, and that if we don't meet that audience, we have failed. We on the Joseph Smith Papers are confident that if we can lay out the life and works of Joseph Smith through his papers, he'll do fine. And so our task is understanding, making available in a way that you can understand the materials that document Joseph Smith's early life from his own papers. And that's a little bit different than some might assume would come from the church history department under the auspices of the church historian in Salt Lake City. But in fact, this is first and foremost an effort to be like other documentary editing projects that provide materials that folks can use to write about Joseph Smith. And I'll talk about how that is done and why it's important. Hopefully we'll answer fairly quickly because I want to leave some time for questions. These questions here. What are the, pro the papers? Why is it important? How does the project quote, work, how do we operate and undertake our endeavors. And we won't have much time, but maybe a word or two about what this tells us of Joseph Smith. 
Elder Jensen, church historian, is now our boss. He chairs the executive committee of the Joseph Smith Papers and gives us uh, counsel, support, and assistance. He has called this in print the most single significant historical project of our generation. One of the reasons why I think that's true is not going to be addressed in the details I'll provide in just a moment, but is an interesting little side note of what's happening behind the scenes with the Joseph Smith Papers Project. Here we are 175 years after, more than 175 years after the organization of the church, and we as a people, we as Latter-day Saint scholars, do not understand the documentary record of our beginnings. Beginnings are always interesting, they're very important, and for Latter-day Saints, they're crucial. As a historian, I've used these records, many of them for a long time. They <clears throat> have been known to us. Uh, many others have used them, but we have not necessarily understood them in the way that allows us to have full meaning and full understanding of how they document our beginnings. And never before have we had a concerted effort of a large group of scholars focused together on unraveling or interconnecting, in many cases, these documents and understanding them in great detail. The rewards will be terrific in terms of understanding where we came from, who we are. President Hinckley, in 1978, was one of the advisors, I think they were called liaison to the 12 back then, to the historical department responsible for counseling the directors of the department on history. And he said to us one day when he was over giving some general counsel to the staff at a staff meeting that he scratches his head often when he was over across the plaza in the um, church administration meeting building at all these long meetings. And I said to myself, we would not have to have these long meetings if we understood our history. And then he said to us, the historians, if we're going to stay on the track the Lord put us on at the beginning of this dispensation, we must know our history. It's clearly crucial for Latter-day Saints who are a historical people, not just conceptually believing in the biblical accounts and other scriptural accounts, but reliving those accounts in our lives and founded on historical events. It's crucial that we understand our history. And in a, in a real sense, this is maybe the first time when we've had concentrated effort, year after year, of a group of scholars and archivists working to understand our history in more detail. This will be a comprehensive edition of all known Joseph Smith documents. What that means is we are not selecting the interesting ones or the important ones. We're not deselecting the controversial or the boring ones. We're publishing the Joseph Smith papers. That is, whatever meets our criteria as a Joseph Smith paper. It is not a documentary history. We're not bringing together everything about Joseph Smith. We're bringing together the materials that were part of his office, his uh, collection, his creation of papers. The letters he wrote, the letters he received and that were in his office. The minutes that were of meetings where he presided, but also the minutes of the High Council, which happened to be recorded in a minute book in his office. So that's the, sort of the parameters of what we're doing, is gathering things that were Joseph Smith papers. And we're doing this following modern documentary editing standards, of which I'll say more in a moment. Documentary editors are, are dedicated to gathering, transcribing, annotating, and publishing documents of historical events or movements or figures, and in this case, of course, Joseph Smith. Why is our project important? Here's some of the reasons. It will make available many of the most important sources of Joseph Smith's life and work. It will, of course, provide accurate access to these materials for scholars wherever they're working. And what this results in, it's happened with other documentary editing projects. Uh, in our first preliminary works that Dean Jesse's done, it's been demonstrated. When scholars have access to the right sources, they use them. 
In fact, if they don't use them, they can't be credible once they're easily accessible to everyone. And that will mean more scholarship about Joseph Smith and early Mormon beginnings. It will mean better scholarship than we would have otherwise. The project will also preserve materials in two ways. One, we have a lot of skill going into getting accurate transcripts, and the transcripts themselves preserve these documents. But we also are able to use modern technology to preserve digital images that have data beyond what the eye can see. And as we go through the project and identify the most important things and create digital records of them, we are preserving them in the state they're in now, and they won't get any better. It's important then because we'll have more accurate texts, easier access to the records, it brings everything together in one place, and we will put the documents in historical context. We're not just throwing the documents out there, although we're going to do some of that too. Our website will have facsimiles of documents and transcriptions of documents before they have historical annotation in many cases. But in the published volumes and eventually on the website, we will provide context that allows you to see how documents work together, the historical setting in which they were created and operated, and how they interconnect. Many other projects have paved the way for us. The Thomas Jefferson papers were first. On the 200th anniversary of the birth of Thomas Jefferson, 1943, Julian Boyd set himself the task of gathering all the, Je the Thomas Jefferson papers and preparing what he envisioned to be a comprehensive edition of Thomas Jefferson papers according to new modern scholarly standards. It took him seven years, 1950, the first volume was published, and that goes on. That work is not finished yet. Uh, our body of materials is a little less, our resources are more, and we're not going to take 57 years. But we have taken a while, and we're going to take a while longer before this is done. After Julian Boyd and Thomas Jefferson, many other projects also started up. I can bear testimony, if you will, to the importance of these because of the Benjamin Franklin Papers. When I say scholars will do more studies and better studies, I can point to my master's thesis as an example. I happened upon a topic of young Benjamin Franklin for my master's thesis at the University of Virginia, which happened to fall within the period that had already been done in the Benjamin Franklin papers. And the first 11 volumes provided me a gold mine. mine. I went to New York Public Library, the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia, to the National Archives, but where I really did my work is in the Alderman Library in Charlottesville at the University of Virginia with the, Thomas, uh, the Benjamin Franklin papers. And we want that to be accessible in the same way to scholars anywhere dealing with Joseph Smith and early Mormon beginnings. In February, there were a series of hearings and testimony before Congress about documentary editing projects. And one of the participants was Ralph Ketchum, who underscored that beginning with the work of Julian Boyd, these modern editions have set a standard for documentary editing that is so different than 19th century standards or even earlier 20th century in terms of their rigorousness and their scholarship that everything since then must meet those standards or they're not credible. So it's not just that we want to meet the standards, which we do, but we must or people cannot have confidence and will not use our materials. David McCullough is one who has testified not just in Congress in February, but in many of his works and speeches about the importance of the papers of the Founding Fathers. Not an academic historian, but a historian who has relied on the folks that have pulled together all these materials for 50 years. He says it allows people like him, and will allow people without extensive historical training, writers and scholars of other disciplines, to write good history, accurate history, because the materials have been brought together by fine scholars. Therefore, we have these great biographies and historical studies of the revolutionary era. We could not have them without the Founding Fathers. 
Their value is unassailable, immeasurable. They're superbly edited, they are thorough, they are accurate. Now scholars would smile. The footnotes are pure gold. <laughs> no one would expect people to think the footnotes are gold, but they are masterpieces of close scholarship, and we have lots of those where we have mined a great deal of information and distilled it into annotation. Without them, he says, I could not have written John Adams or 1776. The task of documentary editing is not just to present the documents, but to make them understandable. Hopefully, as understandable as would have been those who saw the documents in their, in their day. This means, again, the historical setting's important, allusions within the text, uh, people and places, events mentioned that may not be, uh, that we may not be aware of. These are all part of trying to make the documents connect with us so that we can understand them and use them. How does documentary editing work? First, you gather the documents. And that's a major task, even though 90% of it has been in the possession of the church since Willard Richards and Thomas Bullock boxed it into boxes and put it on wagons to come across the plains from Nauvoo. The other 10% or 12 or whatever it turns out to be is everywhere in courthouses, in repositories from the Huntington on the west coast to Beinecke Library on the east coast and many places in between. And so gathering the documents is a major effort. After you collect, then you transcribe. And I'll say a moment, something in a moment about transcription and how that works, and annotate. And then you can publish a volume. Now, what is that volume? It's a reference work. It's not a history. It's not a narrative. It's not bedtime reading, as one of our uh, readers of an early volume said. Oh, I learned so much. I'm cer certainly glad you allowed me to read this, but it's not bedtime reading. <laughs> Even one of our General Authority Review Panel, who is a scholar himself, wrote when he sent back one of the volumes, I have finished the tough slog. <laughs> he was very praiseworthy of what was there, but it was not bedtime reading. So it's a reference volume. And then what can happen? Then others will write the narratives and the history books out of these reference works. So that's the task we've set ourselves and what documentary editors do. Here's just one other example from another writer uh, who is reviewing a work of a, another historian, suggesting that again, we have this great outpouring of scholarship on the revolutionary era because of documentary editing. If you look at that, or what David McCullough said, and substitute for Americans and American history, Mormons and Mormon history, you'll get a sense of why this is vital and what we expect the impact to be of this work. Here's a sample of some of the books that have been published on Joseph Smith. Going back uh, to the pioneer, well, B.H. Roberts' version of the pioneer manuscript history of Joseph Smith, and up to Joseph Smith's Rough Stone Rolling. Every one of these, even Rough Stone Rolling, could have been even better had the edition of the Joseph Smith papers been available. Now, Richard Bushman, who's one of our general editors, had access to much of the background material that we're working with, but he didn't have published volumes yet because we don't have them. One day, a new biographer of Joseph Smith will be able to start from a collection on the shelf and branch out from there in a way that Richard Bushman could not do. While this is for scholars, Latter-day Saint scholars and non-Mormon scholars, Will it have applicability for Latter-day Saints generally? We hope. We had some early discussions before we got the approval to do the Joseph Smith Papers Project with general authorities who cared about this but wanted to help frame the, the way in which it might be done. One of them said, if it's not credible to scholars, it's not worth doing. Another said, if it's not accessible for Latter-day Saints, it's not worth doing. So we have tried to do things that will help Latter-day Saints understand our history better, as well as scholars understand our history better. But what drives this is the scholarly audience. 
and we're trying to provide the background for folks that don't know much about Mormon history, as well as provide pathways for all of our fellow Latter-day Saints who want to know how things were back then, and we know the framework of our history. It then can be not bedtime reading, but a source of study, a reference material for personal study, for lessons, for many things. We think it will be of value to tens of thousands of Latter-day Saints, even though, again, it's geared for the scholars, the Latter-day Saints will be able to access it. I've said something already about the importance for scholars, and I think we don't need to say more, except to underscore again that we've almost been surprised that even though we had these two audiences in mind from the beginning, the general authorities who have authorized the project from the presidency on down have underscored the scholarship has to drive everything. The scholarly audience is first. Now what will we have? We have maybe 2,500 documents. We'll publish 2,000 or more. Our control file has maybe 5,000 entries. Some of those are duplicate versions of the same document. For example, some revelations exist in a number of copies. Uh, sometimes a letter will exist in more than one copy, a letter book copy and a received or sent copy. But we will select the best version of each document and those that meet our criteria as Joseph Smith documents will be prepared in this edition. It will include transcriptions, annotations, and reference material, extensive reference material to help use and understand them. We anticipate having about 30 volumes. Uh, we hope none of the volumes get over 700 pages, but in documentary editing, a 900-page volume isn't unusual. 500 to 700 pages each, maybe 30 volumes. And these will be divided into a number of series. This overview screen shows the series and we'll just briefly go through the series. We'll have three volumes that do the Joseph Smith Diaries. The volume coming out this fall is the volume of the 1830s Diaries. It goes from the first diary Joseph Smith wrote beginning on the 27th of November, 1832, and ends with a little diary kept by his clerk for him, James Mulholland in Commerce, Illinois, before it came, became Nauvoo, so 1832 to 1839 for the first volume. You will notice on this slide that we have 1,600 pages of diary material, but of that, only 31 pages are in Joseph Smith's own hand. For example, the, the graphic up here, which you can't see well enough to read, this is from the, the wonderful sketchbook, is what they call this diary. It's the diary for the six months leading up to and including the dedication of the Kirtland Temple, 1835 and 1836. And Joseph Smith dictated a, a number of entries here that were in the hand of his scribe, but he only wrote in his own hand one, and that's the diary that's on this screen. And whenever you see Joseph Smith's own hand, there's a quality of personality and character which you might expect comes through different from when his scribes are writing for him. It always has nearly every entry that he writes in his own hand encapsulates a little prayer, an acknowledgement of God's hand in his life or a plea for God's blessings. That's one example of how it differs from what his scribes would write. So three journals, volumes, and the last two volumes will be the four large notebooks kept mainly by Willard Richards that detail the Nauvoo activities. In some ways, the historical core, although the diaries can't be beat for importance and interest, will be the document series, which interweaves chronologically the correspondence, revelations, reports, um, minutes of Joseph Smith's life, so you can see how the documents interconnect with one another, and then each document has its own historical setting, and they unfold over time as these events happened. The Revelations and Translation series is designed to present the manuscripts behind our Revelations and Translations and the way those scriptures looked to Latter-day Saints in Joseph Smith's lifetime. So we'll republish a version of the Book of Mormon, the earliest Doctrine and Covenants, or Book of Commandments, 
and we will do the manuscripts behind them. The second volume that we're publishing will come out the first quarter of 2009. It's the first volume in this series, and it will be a volume of manuscript revelations so that we'll have access to the manuscripts behind the Book of Commandments and the manuscripts behind the Doctrine and Covenants. The history series is an interesting, it will be a very interesting and important series. The history of the church has been a seminal document uh, used by scholars and lay folks alike for many decades, centuries almost. Uh, it's also been mistrusted and misunderstood and we will make available the original manuscript, the sources behind the manuscript will be identified and you'll be able, be able to understand how well it was put together according to the standards of the time and use it with much more confidence. It will also give us the opportunity to correct chronological and other errors in the history. These folks worked under very difficult circumstances spread over a number of years using the documents at hand, and in some cases we have more documents at hand than they did, and we can make corrections that uh, have been embedded in the history all these years. The first volume of the history series will be the third volume we publish, and it brings together all the early histories that sort of lead up to the creation of this massive manuscript history of the church. It's an introduction, if you will, to the other volumes. The legal and business series will be of great interest. This is one that Elder Jensen, a lawyer himself, always uh, has asked me several times, Ron, can't we put that on the web? The legal and business, nobody's going to want to read that. <laughs> I think he forgets how many Mormon lawyers there are. <laughs> I tell him that we're going to sell more volumes of the legal than we will of <laughs> the revelations. But at any rate, it's going to be very important because it has so much new material and helps underscore uh, why Joseph Smith did what he did and how well he operated in the legal and financial uh, world he lived in. We'll have three volumes. The first is going to be fully drafted, hopefully, by the end of this year. We're now writing cases, not just gathering case files. And I think it will be a marvelous addition to historical understanding of Joseph Smith, of the legal world he lived in, and of the challenges the church faced in his lifetime. The administrative series will bring together records that were kept in his office, the minute books, the letter books, and other records of great importance. Now, just a little bit more detail about how the project operates on the operational level, day to day. We collect the documents, we study each one to make sure we understand the chain of custody, the provenance, that is who created it, when, where it's been. Um, we are all aware of the Hoffman problems in the 1980s. We think we know what all those are, but he's not the only one capable of forging documents. Most of these documents, again, have been in our possession for a long time, but we are very cautious in working through a provenance and chain of custody for every document so we can have confidence in it. Then we create transcriptions. And the transcriptions are not simply, let's type this out and put it to the web or prepare it for publication. We verify three different times with different techniques and eventually proofing against the original with, with um, modern technology where we need to. We have used multispectral imaging, we use magnification, uh, ultraviolet light. George Th Throckmorton was one of the uh, criminal investigators that helped unravel, unveil the forgeries of Mark Hoffman. He then afterward worked for the Utah State Crime Lab. We consulted him when we were going to purchase a new microscope about which kind of equipment he would recommend as being most useful. He said, well, here's what you could do, or there's what you could do, but I can save you some money. Get the raw images of a very high resolution scan, put it in Adobe Photoshop, and I'll show you what kind of tweaks will let you see what you can't see with the microscope. <laughs> so together, we have been able to do some very interesting things in reading and recovering texts. Dean Jesse has been involved in correcting texts of Joseph Smith for many, many years. One of the most uh, interesting examples is 
an item in the history of the church that was published, transcribed and published, Emma had another child which did not survive its birth. And Dean showed us some time ago that that doesn't say Emma had another child. It says Emma had another chill. Malaria, fever, and chills. And the historians that wrote the early history wrote in did not survive its birth because if the child had survived, they would have known it. And they didn't know of any child and they transcribed it wrong. So we correct those kinds of things. Here's just one other example of what we've been able to correct. Joseph Smith was involved in many law cases. After one of them, he had been in Springfield before a circuit judge. He came back to Nauvoo and explained the experience he just had. And Willard Richards just scrawled as quickly as he could this account of Joseph Smith speaking about his recent experience. Willard Richards, you know, was a Thompsonian doctor. And one of our volume editors who has to deal with Willard Richards' hand says, I will never forgive Joseph Smith for having assigned a doctor as his scribe. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, that's unfair to Willard because he could write very legibly, but when he was in a hurry trying to capture uh, speech as it was given, it deteriorated into a scrawl. So here is the text. Uh, you probably can all see that well enough to transcribe it, or even if you could see it, couldn't transcribe it as I couldn't. <laughs> One spiritual-minded circuit judge and several fit men. That's the way it was published in one transcription. But as we've looked, looked at this and worked through it, knowing Willard Richard's handwriting better, it really says, one spindle shank circuit judge and several fat men. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm sure captured better the feeling of Joseph Smith as he described this experience. So we will not have as many that are that humorous, but we'll have corrections that are <laughs> important in the text. And the annotation, I won't take more time on that, but we do work very hard on the annotation. It's probable that half our resources go to annotation or to the creation of reference materials around it. We have new maps, a wonderful new maps that are based on extensive research of these places important in Joseph Smith's life and in our history. Uh, we'll have, we have gone back to the sources on Joseph Smith's own pedigree and found many errors and corrections and refinements and additions we could make. We have um, glossaries. The glossary, by the way, defines terms for non-Latter-day Saints so that if we use them as Latter-day Saints a little differently, they can see what it meant to Latter-day Saints. But it's important for you because it defines terms as they were used at the time. And today there's some terms we use a little differently than they did. So the glossaries are very important and um, other reference materials we'll have. Production editing is a major endeavor. It's not just ensuring quality, it's building in quality and it takes months of work. We have wonderful people involved in that. One of the ways we ensure quality is by review um, panels or committees that read every volume. There is more peer review on the Joseph Smith papers than any other project like it. Thomas Jefferson, uh, Jonathan Edwards, Roger Williams, they, none of them had review like this is getting. Because it matters to so many people and because it matters to us that it be credible and it be right. So we have a general authority review panel. We have internal reviews. We have an external review panel of scholars. And then when we finally publish, we have confidence that we've done the best we can do at the time. Not perfect, we'll continue to learn. The website will continue to expand the information, sometimes correct information. But it will be usable and credible. One demonstration of this is we have passed muster with the NHPRC, the National Historical Records and Publications Commission, to get their endorsement or certification as a project that meets these standards. One of our colleagues in the field of documentary editing, Harry Reid, who chairs the editorial committee of the Benjamin Franklin papers and is the general editor of the Jonathan Edwards papers, wrote this little comment for the news about why this endorsement matters to us. And it matters because it helps other people understand that we're meeting rigorous scholarship standards and can be believed that, that it will be credible. We have dozens of people involved. We have full-time employees like myself, some paid for by the church, some paid for on project funds by donations 
from the Larry and Gail Millers, uh, from their foundation now, but before from them individually. We have student researchers, we have part-time volunteers, we have full-time volunteers, we have contractors. Uh, dozens of people in all, in all are involved in the work of the Joseph Smith Papers. Our outside reviewers, let me just quickly show who they are. Harry Stout, who I just mentioned, is one. Stephen Stein, who has published a great deal in American religious history and has edited volumes of the Jonathan Edwards Papers, is another. Mary Jo Klein wrote the book on documentary editing, and her husband happens, happens to be the editor of the, of the um, George Washington Papers at the University of Virginia, and Terrell Givens, a Latter-day Saint scholar. So these four LDS scholars, or these four scholars are, are outside reviewers. These volumes will be published by a new imprint, the Church Historian's Press. In some ways, it would be nice if this was going to be published by Yale or Oxford, and we had conversations with them. But at the end, Elder Jensen believed that this was an opportunity to create for the church an imprint that would embody the highest scholarship and that could earn trust and credibility over time. So we have a, a high hurdle in the sense that we're Latter-day Saints employed by the church history department, published by the church historian's press, and yet you can believe our scholarship. And we are going to earn that trust over time, and I'm confident we will. Richard Turley, assistant church historian, has made this uh, little statement that was published in the press at one point to underscore why the church historian's press is important. The first thing is, hopefully it will reassure Latter-day Saints that they don't have to be afraid of the scholarship because the church historian is the one that's offering this in his imprint. But it's going to earn the reputation of quality scholarly work because nothing is going to be in that neighborhood. Nothing will be printed on it by the imprint except the best scholarship based on good documentary research. I've talked about the publication schedule. I don't think we need to say more about that. Our website, josephsmithpapers.org, is an information site, a teaser site. It has some sample documents. It will be interesting to you, but it's uh, only a teaser compared to what we're going to have a year from now when we'll begin to offer full text and transcriptions and uh, eventually all the annotation. A reference materials on the web will extend what will be in the published volumes and make available a great deal of research about people, places, thought, terms, and again the maps and other aids. Let me just give you one example of the charts. All of us as scholars have understood some of the basic framework of how the church operated in Kirtland, for example, and how it was organized. None of us understood the details, and we do now. We have a chart that lays out the church organization in a, in a very concise but uh, insightful way that had to be, you'll look at that chart and say, well, this is interesting. I look at that chart and say, how many hundreds of hours did that take? At every piece of that um, chart to get the documentation right behind it. Richard Bushman made this statement, the closer you get to Joseph Smith in the sources, the stronger he will appear, rather than the reverse, as is so often assumed by his critics. Richard made this point a little differently in another time when I heard him speak. With many men, he said, the closer you get to them, the less confidence you have in them. You see their flaws and their strengths don't look so great in close detailed context. But with Joseph Smith, the closest we get to him, the closer we get to him, the more you do see, as he suggests here, his strength. And you also end up feeling like here's a guy who, given the challenges, did a pretty decent job of everything and a magnificent job of most things in rising above the challenges and staying the course in spite of all the difficulties. All of the scholars of the Joseph Smith papers would echo Richard in the sense that the more we know Joseph, the more we study early Mormon history, the more confidence we have that we don't need to defend him, we need to present him and his documents and he'll do okay. This is one example from Jeff Walker who's coordinating our legal series team. 
We learn a great deal about Joseph Smith that we didn't know before, and part of what we learn in the legal cases is that Joseph Smith was a careful, capable, and sophisticated businessman and citizen. The legal team has said this a little differently informally. Joseph Smith understood the law and worked within the law better than his critics. Uh, Daniel H. Wells was a non-Mormon justice of the peace in Nauvoo, later a counselor to Brigham Young in Utah. Daniel Wells said, the best lawyer I ever knew was Joseph Smith. And why, you say, because he didn't read the law, he wasn't a lawyer, because he had to live 200 law cases. And um, he counseled with many lawyers and gave counsel to his lawyers and became pretty skilled at it. Let me conclude by acknowledging what has been in print and public before, that we could not be what we are as a project without the Millers. This is a little clip from the Deseret News that talked about the Millers funding for this project. The church has given great support. The authorization to publish uh, offices and infrastructure, but the number of us that are paid by the church on this project are pretty, pretty few, a handful. All the rest are supported by the foundation or the endowment, excuse me, that, the, that Larry and Gail have provided. One of Larry's interesting insights that's become sort of a motto of the project comes from W.W. W. Phelps' great hymn, Praise to the Man, and the chorus or the uh, ending where he says, millions shall know Brother Joseph again. Our intention is to do this work in such a way that we'll know Joseph for the first time in many cases in detail about the documents and events of his life. But there's a sense in which Brother Miller is right, that through this, millions, as uh, Phelps prophesied in his hymns, can know Brother Joseph again. So that's the endeavor we're in. It's a very demanding and large one, but with the kind of support we have, with the importance this is, with the blessings that we feel we've received to have this project come at the right time with the right resources and the right talent and the right authorizations, we're confident we can get this out so you can all benefit from it in the future. There's a lot of questions, so just choose whichever one you want. Okay. Uh, please say a word about Elder Jensen and his vision for church history. It's been a joy to work with Elder Jensen. We love him as a leader and as a colleague. I'll just say this word about him. He'll have to describe his vision to us as it continues to unfold. He got us aside the other day and um, reminded us that not just in the published volumes, but in the website, the scholarship has to drive everything. Of course, Latter-day Saints will use this, but this has got to be designed for the scholars. Now, the reaction of some of our folks is, but we have neighbors, we have children and grandchildren and wives and daughters that want to know about these things, and we want to connect to the members. And his vision is the church history department, especially him as church historian and Rick Turley as assistant church historian, care about Latter-day Saints. And that's their stewardship, and they're going to figure out how to better serve Latter-day Saints in terms of our history. But our task, he underscored, is to do the scholarship, to lay the scholarly foundation and build a scholarly core that we can count on, that we can understand, and we should not lose focus of that. Um, in history texts, historians' bias always come out. What has been done to limit bias, particularly faithful bias, or is that desirable? Great question, and we could take 20 minutes on that at least. Today, I think no serious scholar expects that historians or other scholars are going to somehow step outside who they are and outside their perspectives and write, quote, without bias. That's not expected, it's not necessary, it's probably not possible. What is possible is to be fair-minded, to try and uh, understand rather than attack and defend. And we've discovered that we can, in fact, 
work together with scholars of every persuasion as long as we can honestly look at the issues in the documents and talk about them without trying to attack and defend one another. Richard Bushman wrote a little essay with Jan Ships that was published in a major historical journal uh, a few months back. And while he wasn't trying to put down apologetics, he tried to make a contrast between the apologist who wants to attack the enemy and the historian who wants to take him to lunch. <laughs> and the point would be that we are going to write from a Latter-day Saint perspective. That's who we are. But we're going to quote primary sources. We're going to be very careful to try and have neutral language. We're trying to be fair. And when there's evidence that we don't particularly like, but it's part of the record and it's relevant to the point we're making, it has to be there. Uh, will there be bias in the sense that this is from a Latter-day Saint-centric perspective? Yes. People would expect nothing else because we are who we are. But they can tell if we've been honest and if we've grounded this in the sources and if we're meeting scholarly standards. And that is what we have to work very hard to do. What is the role of the Community of Christ in this project? Great uh, question. I'm glad someone asked that because uh, their role is very important. They have, uh, if we have 90%, they have 4 or 5%, and we have 6% scattered across the, the country. They've been very cooperative. It's been to their benefit and to our benefit. We've had access to the materials. We've had permission to publish. We expect that to continue. For example, in this volume coming out in the first quarter of 2009, we have some Revelations manuscripts that are part of the volume that came from the Community of Christ. Uh, in the volume on the histories, we have the John Whitmer history, which the Community of Christ owns and holds. We were able to conserve it, to uh, return it from uh, its damaged state to a, mo a better state. And by underwriting that and getting it back to them in better sh shape than it was, they were more than pleased to have us uh, use it in our project, have access to it for text verification, and of course to publish it. That's just one example. Um, I am 62. Will I live to see all of the volumes published? I am 64, and I intend to live to see them all published. <laughs> but it's not going to be tomorrow. <laughs> One of my regrets is that Elder Maxwell didn't live to see any volumes published. He loved this project. He was an early um, fan, advisor, uh, and helped guide the foundations for this project but he and President Hinckley won't see them from this side of the veil. <laughs> Hopefully many of the rest of us will. Uh, will the, church, the Joseph Smith Papers have an impact on church curriculum materials? If so, what will it be? It will have an impact, I can say with confidence, because it has had an impact. The very best piece of scholarship we've had in, in adult curriculum for a generation, in my view, and I'm not trying to put down what we've had before, because we've had some good materials, is the Joseph Smith Manual we're using in Relief Society and Priesthood. They do cite the history of the church, but in every citation of the history of the church, there is a reference to the source behind it. And they are very careful in their use of sources so that they're using the best Joseph Smith sources and uh, not using those that are questionable or secondary or have been misused so many times in the past. How could they do that? Some of the people on our project, Dean Jesse and Ron Barney, provided the materials reviewed the materials, and they had access to some of the beginnings. There's no question that the curriculum folks in church education, uh, seminaries and institute, as well as the folks that write uh, our manuals, want access to the best material, and will use it when they have easy access. But it is true they don't have time to go down and do original research in the archives for what they write normally. And so until this is out, it's going to be very hard for them to um, accomplish what this question suggests. I will say that it should also have an impact uh, someday on another edition of our scriptures, because every time we've had a new edition of scriptures, the folks preparing that, the scripture committee for the 1981 edition, for example, have access to the best manuscripts and the best scholarship and take that into account. In the future, hopefully, we can provide them some things that they didn't have before. 
Uh, during the, your involvement in the Joseph Smith Papers, were there any major surprises? Um, in terms of learning new things every day, major surprises. Um, I guess the biggest surprise is we thought we had three dozen Joseph Smith legal cases and we have 200. That was a surprise. These are judicial proceedings. They're not all full-blown court proceedings, but nonetheless, 200 in uh, the short life he lived is pretty amazing, and you have to just wonder how he got anything else done. Um, can you please give some of the current church history that is an error that will be corrected by means of the project? Oh, there are so many interesting little details. Let me just give one that we're dealing with right now, and we haven't even sorted it out, so I can't tell you where we'll land. But we all know Doctrine and Covenants section 107. That's, uh, that was published in the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants. Back then it was section three, and it was called On Priesthood. We don't understand very well how it was put together. It's different than most of the revelations. They, most of the revelations are, Behold, thus saith the Lord, the text, amen. This is a different kind. It's more like section 20. So how it originated is an interesting story. I wrote a dissertation about Brigham Young and the Quorum of the Twelve. I know that revelation. I know the setting for the revelation. I've used it. I, it's very important. I haven't answered that kind of a question for myself before, and we're looking at it. But the other thing is, it's been, since the history of the church dated it this way, dated 28 March 1835. That doesn't work. If the setting that the, church, the history of the church gives for that date it's the wrong date. That is, if the setting that gives for the uh, meeting where this uh, originated is correct, the date doesn't work. If the date works, the setting is wrong. Because we know where many of the 12 were on that day and it wasn't in Kirtland, they were somewhere else. And Joseph himself that weekend was somewhere else. So there was an error in the minutes that the history picked up. And when we're done, we'll redate that sometime after 28 March, possibly 28 April, and. Uh, has to be before March, the, May the 4th, when the 12 left. So day after day, we have those kinds of things where we have access to resources that Willard Richard and his staff didn't have. They had access to things we don't have. They could ask people that lived through it. But uh, together, I think we're going to end up with a better understanding. Will the work be indexed, cross-reference, database searchable? Uh, yes, yes, yes. We... <laughs> Another question is, will it be on the web? We will have all the content on the web one day. Uh, the one day is being sorted out, what that means. Um, but clearly the church has an interest that this be accessible to Latter-day Saints and to others freely and openly. Uh, some of the other projects do too, but not all. That is, the University of Virginia has an electronic edition called the Rotunda which is subscription only to get access to all these materials. We will not have subscriptions and they will be all there. The indexing is crucial. A lot of our people have been to what's called informally Camp Edit. It's funded by the NHPRC. It's held every June in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. John Kaminsky of Madison is one of the major figures that helps train documentary editors. And his mantra is a book is a documentary editing book is only as good as its index. It's a reference material. If you don't have ways to get into what you've done, how can anybody use it? So we have right now three full-time people working on indexing volume one. And that will be in draft form by the, by the end of this month. It will be reviewed and upgraded if necessary. And it will be, um, we hope, a model of indexing for this kind of work. And every volume will have an index and they will all be searchable in other ways on the web. Uh, how much will we be able to learn about Joseph Smith, especially as scribes? There will be many discussions with documents as the project unfolds about the role of the scribes. We've identified scribes we didn't know before. Uh, we've known for a long time that Joseph didn't write much in his own hand. It's mostly as scribes. But you will be able, at the end of the day, to know who these scribes were. You'll know about them. 
Let me just give you one example. Revelations 1 that will be published in the first quarter of 2009 doesn't have what our standard biographical index. What it has is a scribal directory. And each of the major scribes that are in these Revelations manuscripts has an entry saying, here's who he was, here's the characteristics of his handwriting, here's how we've transcribed it. So you will know a lot about the scribes. And they were very important. And one of the reasons Joseph Smith had great records is because of his scribes. One of the reasons we have less than we wish we had is because of his scribes. <laughs> Warren Parrish apostatized. James Mulholland and um, um, Robert, not Campbell, Thompson died young. Uh, very difficult time keeping good scribes at work. When Willard Richards, in spite of being a doctor, arrived in Nauvoo, in early Nauvoo, and began in December of 1841 working for Joseph Smith, we, we got a continuous record, the best we'd ever had, that carried through the rest of his life. Willard Richards gave a great, uh, dedicated service to that. Uh, our papers being made available for this project that were previously unknown to the church. Uh, we are finding things we didn't know before, private collectors that have them and have been willing to share, uh, materials that were in our own holdings that we didn't have good control of that we've been able to sort through. Most of the documents are generally familiar outside the legal papers, but there are new documents everywhere scattered about. Um, Scott, you're going to help me with the time. I don't... Pick, pick a couple more. One or two more? Okay. Um, Uh, you mentioned the best sources where you have multiple versions. What are the qualifications for best? Interesting question. Our documents volume, the first document volume, has 100 revelations, uh, 117 documents, most of which are revelations. And the, um, many of those do exist in more than one copy, but, but some of them do not. We started out feeling like the best thing to do was to take the last version under the control of Joseph Smith and publish that, and then edit back to the manuscripts. But for a variety of reasons, that didn't work. So that whole volume had to be rewritten. And now we go back to the earliest and best, and by that we mean the earliest complete manuscript of a revelation that we can verify, uh, and, and that's the version we use. So in some cases, there's a toss-up where you have three or four versions and you say these two are about the same date and they're early and they're comparable and you're just gonna have to flip a coin. We acknowledge them all, we'll list them all in the document calendar, but we select the earliest and best revelation. And in other cases, uh, we'll go back to the original whenever it exists and not a published version. Final question. Will the Joseph Smith papers include the Kirtland Egyptian papers and or the Book of Mormon, Book of Abraham manuscripts? Um, yes, in some fashion we will do this. In some fashion, I say, because it's yet to be sorted out fully. There are two parts to this question and two items from this collection of materials that for sure will be in our Documents 3 volume. That is assuming that we agree with the help of John Gee and Brian Hauglid, including a meeting next week on the dating of some of these and where they fit. Uh, we will eventually, in the Joseph Smith um, Revelations and Translation series, ha have access, hopefully, and maybe repurpose the work that Brian and John do, and have a section on, on the Book of Abraham and Egyptian materials. So we'll have a couple of selections, one of which is in Joseph Smith's own hand and is undoubtedly a Joseph Smith document, and some of the earliest Book of Abraham uh, manuscripts in Docs 3, and the rest is going to wait until they do some more work so we understand them better. Thank you very much.